I'm here to talk to you today about what it actually means to do VR on the web. Um, so just a quick show of hands, who here has used VR before? Cool, so that seems to be about like 40%. So yeah, um, I've been doing this talk for, well, not this talk, but I've been talking on VR for uh, about three or four years now. And every time I ask that question, it gets a little bit more. So I'm hoping one day I'll ask and the entire audience will put the hand up. It only happened once, but it was at a VR company. So, yeah. Um, so who here actually has their own VR headset? And I would include cardboard in this as well. Cool. Wow, I loaded you put your hand up when I mentioned cardboard. Yeah, that's really awesome. It's, it's actually got some, um, some quite great reach these days. It's really cool. So for those of you who haven't seen one before, um, this is the Gear VR, this is the headset which, headset which we make. And, um, um, and VR works by kind of uh, tracking the user's head position in, in virtual space so that you can show them content and um, give them audio content, which gives them the illusion of being somewhere else, which gives this really powerful feeling of immersion. This allows to bring them content which totally brings them out of their situation and they're entirely focused on what you want to bring them, which as a, if you're a media provider is something incredibly powerful. So right now, the era of VR is probably the second or third wave of VR hardware. Um, most headsets look something like this with a screen and some lenses, but VR is moving incredibly quickly, and I don't know what the VR of tomorrow is going to look like, but I think we're going to look back on, um, on VR the same way we look on these telephones, because they were big and clunky. But I think VR in maybe three to five years is going to be much smaller. It's going to be much more integrated into people's everyday lives, and it's going to be faster and smarter so now is like a real great time to like get started. So yeah, why am I talking about VR at a web talk? Well, believe it or not, there are virtual reality web browsers. So this is uh, Samsung Internet for Gear VR. So this is a, um, a web browser which runs in a VR headset. So that's pretty cool. Um, we have a couple of APIs for adding extra immersion um, or taking advantage of the VR platform. So here you can set the skybox. So you can, you can give um, some environmental context to a website. We've also extended the, the video tag so that you can show 360 media and 3D media um, immersively in just a single line of HTML, which I think is pretty fantastic and is very webby. So we've also started working on new APIs for immersive content. And I say we as in the web community, not, not Samsung in particular, although we are um, contributors. And this allows us to render um, from a canvas and display it to, um, in 3D to a virtual reality headset. So these are, these are known as the Web VR APIs. So in this example, I'm, I'm rendering a page to a canvas. And then when you request present, it shows it full screen to the user. And all I've started doing here is rendering the same scene side by side, one for each eye. So what do these WebVR um, APIs do? Well, they provide you two kinds of areas. One is to help you render. So this allows you to, um, to get the, the information from the headset for, about what lens, what what the render context is to allow you to put data out there. And you don't have to do any of the distortion yourself. You just have to render twice. And it will handle any distortion to get a really crisp 3D image on the user. The other side of it is returning information for what the user is actually looking at and their space in, 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 in the real world. So for the case of headsets like the Gear VR and the Cardboard, um, this information just consists of three degrees of freedom rotational information. But if you're on something like the HTC Vive, you get full positional, positional and rotation tracking, so you can look around objects, which for something that's being in the web is, like, I think, pretty amazing, because these APIs have only been in development for um, 
um, about a year now. They're still not um, finalized, but they're beginning to settle down a bit. So now's a really good time to actually um, start having a play with them. They also um, work cross-browser. So you don't need to actually be in a, in a VR browser like Samsung Internet for Gear VR or, or, or Chrome for Daydream. You can also work, they also work in Chrome and Firefox with the HTC Vive or the Oculus. Um, a HoloLens is, well, Edge for HoloLens is soon going to be supporting the APIs as well, which allow you to do the, use the VR API to do augmented reality, which is so cool. Sorry, I, I love this stuff. I'm a bit of a geek. Um, so what can you use this stuff for? So I've seen some good examples for shopping and travel where you can just see what you're getting before you buy it in a context you're familiar with. So no more buying, accidentally buying doll's house furniture on Amazon because you can actually see how big it is. I've seen some great examples for education where they've put children on a school bus with, um, with, gear, with um, Google Cardboard to take them on a school trip to Mars. And it's had wonderful effects for health. But I'm personally a bit of a sci-fi geek, and so the thing which really wows me is, is kind of co-presence and the metaverse. So these are, this is the ability to have a virtual avatar in a virtual space, allowing you to communicate and share an experience with someone from anywhere else in the world. And this, to me, is like the web of science fiction. This is, this is the web which I've been promised since I was a tiny kid about what the web was going to be. And it's happening now with virtual reality. And I'd, I'd love to see the web become the primary platform for this shared metaverse. Um, so yeah, you, I'm not just like going off about this because I think it's cool. You can actually build it today. So this demo was put together by Boris Smus for um, um, using web APIs today and reimagining them for giving them new purpose in virtual reality. So this here is using WebRTC for audio. I've, I've muted the laptop so you don't hear it. Um, but it's, um, so you've probably used WebRTC already. If you've used um, uh, Google Hangouts or Skype on the web, that uses WebRTC in, um, as its transport. And so here we're using that for the audio transport. And you do this by creating a new WebRTC connection. And then you can use the Web Audio APIs to get an audio stream and attach it to that WebRTC connection. So this allows you to get two people to talk remotely from any two browsers. They don't have to be the same browser type, just any two browsers. But you can also use data channels. And these can use UDP or TCP to send data very quickly peer-to-peer, -peer, which means that you can maintain an avatar state between, between clients without having to run through your server, which, if you're like me and kind of cheap, that's fantastic because it saves you a whole, bu a whole bunch of bandwidth. And this is, this is something you can play with today. I had a go with it. WebRTC is a little awkward to work with but definitely something worth checking out if you want to um, build shared experiences or some kind of um, um, multiplayer um, game of some kind. But why would you do VR on the web at all? Because I mean, one could d definitely arguably ask that because if you're running on native, you can squeeze out every last bit of performance out of the device. But all that gives you is good visual fidelity. And if visual fidelity that was all that mattered, we would be watching Blu-rays and not Netflix. And the web already has a pedigree for delivering media content. So like, what you get from the web is more than just um, some nice API for working with stuff. But you have great power of URLs where you can give someone a link. They know what to do with it. They can click on it and it, will, and it will take them exactly to the content they want to experience. You also have the largest audience because web browsers work on a plethora of devices from phones and computers to TVs and even fridges. Don't do VR on a fridge. Although, weirdly enough, actually, a friend of mine um, 
ran one of the WebGL like, spec tests on one of the Samsung fridges. Amazing performance. Why did he put a graphics card in a fridge? <sighs> yeah, so yeah. VR on the web is really good. You'll reach a huge bunch of people. Unfortunately, if you're on the web, that comes with some expectations. Because users nowadays are really impatient. Like, 53% of visits are abandoned if a mobile site takes more than three seconds to load. Which I don't know about you, but when you're trying to deliver tens, of, tens or hundreds of megabytes worth of content, that is a scary statistic. So what can you do here? Well, if you start treating VR like video content, and we can actually buffer it in, so you don't, um, you don't load an entire video at once and display it to the user. So for VR, you would load just your engine and the assets you need to immediately show straight away. Then you can start, start it rendering within only a few seconds. You can then start pulling down higher resolution assets or assets needed later in the experience. So here's a great demo put together by the Play Canvas team. So this is running on a throttled network that, uh, connection to emulate mobile. And this got started in, what, was that like a second? Incredibly fast. It, it downloaded the content, and it, it downloaded low-quality assets of all of them. And then it starts, not manually, but um, uh, pulling down dish, additional high-quality assets to slowly upgrade it. So we, if you look at the network diagram for as this is running, the network actually is still running flat out at this point and pulling down additional content. So this means that if a user stays in the same um, area for a long time, the content will just get better. But if they start moving on, we've actually already cached the additional content they may need, so it will load really quickly. But this seems like a really like, a difficult pain in the ass thing to do. Fortunately, we have service workers. So I haven't got time to go over them for you. So Fortunately, Nolan was kind enough to already do that. Um, but it gives us these, um, this great, these great patterns for actually maintaining content, or well, like pulling down content as we need it. So here's, here's a small code example. So what I'm doing here is that the moment the service worker is started, I'm actually pulling down the, the fundamental assets which I actually need to build something. So just my engine, my initial models, and my, some of my textures. This is for like the very first one or two seconds of what the user needs to see. And then I respond to all network requests with cache content if I have it. Otherwise, we fall back to the network. But in theory, everything I need, I should have cached already. We could then, sense, we could then set up a listener so that we can have the client um, request to pull down different assets as they're needed. So for example, the, the user starts their scene, they've set it up, and it's pulled down the very first content they needed. So we're rendering content within the first few seconds. The client then sees that the user isn't actually advancing through the content. They're just stood in the same place, looking around, enjoying the scene we set up around them. So what we're going to do instead, we're going to dynamically pull down higher resolution assets um, of the stuff which is around us. This allows us to, um, to actually improve the experience they're actually having. But if we have another user which is just rushing through our content, we can start dynamically pulling down content for the second and third areas so that it's going to be there when they arrive. But we only pull down the stuff that's going to be needed soon. We don't pull down the whole lot. And that way, we save their data connection. There's another really cool thing coming to service workers soon, which is um, cross-origin service workers and foreign fetch. This allows your CDN to actually set up a service worker. And then any, any websites which use that CDN can also access um, cached content. So if you've got stuff like models of particular pieces of hardware, which are going to be reused across experiences, or particular versions of libraries, which are going to be reused again and again, then they only need to be downloaded for the user once. So if there's a group of websites using a lot of the same content from the same CDN, then after the first load, they're all going to have that content really quickly. 
But I think the most important thing about being on the web is that to me, being on the web means you work everywhere. You can't just ship content just to one platform or one device. And this is very applicable for VR. Because right now, whilst the VR web is very small, people aren't going to be going from VR website to VR website to VR website. They are probably going to have to find their headset, dig out from a drawer somewhere, and put it on just for your VR experience. So you're going to want to show them something really early. You can't just like, have an interstitial being like, oh, yeah, open this up on your phone or open this up on your HTC Vive. You've got to have this. You've got to have it work on their phone and on their desktop. You should support VR on the phone and test it on the phone to make sure it works um, there, as well as on the higher end devices. Because right now, um, as you saw when you raised your hands at the beginning, Cardboard and Gear VR have, have the farthest re far more reach than the desktop um, VR headsets by an order of magnitude. So although you can do an incredible experience on the desktop, especially with positional tracking and the advanced controllers, um, you need to ship for mobile as well, because that's where the majority of the VR users are right now. When dealing with controllers specifically, you're going to want to be able to handle um, the advanced positional track controllers, but also controllers like the Xbox controller, if they've got one plugged in, or, or if they're on a, a cardboard, no controller, because all they can do is look and tap. So it's important to consider who you're targeting and make sure you work for a particular baseline. So what's coming in the VR future? I don't know. You guys haven't built it yet. But what I do know is that we have 25 years worth of web content, which we already have access to. So we probably want to start thinking, as, as a web platform, how we want to bring this into the future. So one method I've been pushing for, personally, is the ability to have um, 3D transforms actually get applied in the web and have some effect. So you can bring out elements into 3D and experience them in the web as embedded, well, not embedded, but sticking out of the window. You can also, um, you also might consider, should the web handle 3D models? And if so, how should it handle this? Should it handle the metaverse or avatars? But these are all questions which I don't have an answer to. And these discussions are happening right now. Like, literally just in October, there was the first W3C Web VR um, workshop where a lot of these problems were raised and discussed. And there have, discussions are happening right now in the open on GitHub and the W3C Web VR community group. I implore you to get involved, because right now, if you, if you start getting involved now, you can help shape the future of the web. Thank you very much.